This is George, an interview with George Boyd. We're in WIL's t TV station in uh, Urbana, Illinois. It's March 11th, 2008. Henry Radcliffe is the uh, man doing the videotaping, and my name is Nancy Rotzel. So, George, tell me about your experience with World War II. How old were you when it started? Well, I was born in 1934, and so I was seven at that time. Do you remember World? Do you remember Pearl Harbor and the reports? Very definitely, uh, because it was in December. Even then, some stores would be open on uh, Sunday in the afternoon, and in downtown Urbana there was a dime store, five and dime store. And uh, I was downtown at that time when it began. And uh, people started talking, you know, they heard on the radio or whatever, so I went home. And uh, so that's how it began. How did your parents react? Well, I, uh, I had two sisters and uh, one brother. And my oldest sister was married at that time to uh, a flyer that she had met from Rantoul. He was from Kansas, but he was kind of a typical wild flyer of that era. Uh, they got married in, I'm going to say, about 36 or so. And uh, he had a they were separated at the time, and she had come home with with two children. And he he came by the house and in 1940, and he wanted to go to Canada and join the RCAF, Royal Canadian Air Force, so he could get involved in the war. That's what flyers did. And so he did do that, and uh, they ended up getting a divorce. Uh, I, I don't know exactly when the divorce was actually done, uh, but at any rate, he was eventually killed during the war. Uh, he flew on the Plashti mission August 1st, 1943, when they bombed the Romanian oil fields. It's one of the most notable raids of the war. And it was a very long flight uh, with B-24 liberators. Uh, they used the B-24s because they could fly farther and carry a bigger payload. And uh, it was a volunteer mission. Uh, he had already been in England doing raids from England. And he flew the lead plane in the third uh, group that bombed Fleshty. And they were the most successful of the three. Uh, and then later, in early J January of 1944, he was killed on uh, returning from a mission over Germany. So your sister was upset, I mean, your parents? Yeah. Oh, yeah, and uh, they had two children, uh, two girls, who live in this area. My other sister, uh, her, she married someone she'd gone to Urbana High School with, and he was a member, he lied about his age, joined the National Guard in Urbana, the 106th Cavalry. And they were cavalry when he joined in the late 30s. And uh, they had horses in 1940. And a lot of people don't seem aware of this, but uh, President Roosevelt federalized a lot of the reserve and National Guard units and sent them uh, into various locations for training. The 106th went down to Fort Polk, Louisiana and participated in some maneuvers that were conducted down there in early 1941. And at the time they went down there, they had two half tracks. There weren't Jeeps. This was before the Jeeps and they, the rest were horses. It was a horse cavalry. And they were down there, and then the war began while they were still down there. And uh, he had never finished high school because he had lied about his age. 
and they federalized him in 1940. And they sent them when the war began down to the Panama Canal Zone because they were afraid the Japanese were going to try and take control of the Panama Canal. And so the 106th went down to Panama. And I don't recall exactly how long he was down there. I'm going to say a year or so. And he came back. Uh, so that would be about 1942 at some point, late 42 maybe. Even though he hadn't completed high school, he had qualified for officer's candidate school. And he went to Fort Knox, Kentucky, which is the armor school to this day. And uh, went through officer's candidate school, became a second lieutenant. And then he went to ranger school, which was sort of like the Green Berets today. And then he came home and married my sister in early 1943. And then he was sent uh, to the south, I'm not sure exactly where Georgia perhaps, and became a member of the Third Army. Uh, Patton was uh, placed in charge of the Third Army. And the Third Army was taken uh, in complete, uh, all their equipment, everything, to England. They didn't go into Europe on D-Day. Uh, Patton had some problems with uh, Eisenhower, uh, who had been a clerk for him at one point, but uh, then Roosevelt had made him, uh, you know, the general in charge of the European forces of the United States. In fact, all European forces in England and Europe. And Patton didn't particularly get along with a lot of people. He was rather uh, a brash. Uh, he participated in World War I. He had some very definite ideas about how to fight wars. And uh, so he was sent in after D-Day and the losses in invading Europe, uh, which are well known, Utah Beach and that sort of thing. Uh, they more or less got bogged down once they moved inland a short distance because of the hedgerows they have in Europe. And that's one of the things Patton had discovered during World War I. And he had, was a very brilliant general. And so they sent him in with the Third Army from England after a month or two. And they broke out in just a short time through the hedgerows and began their push across uh, Europe, uh, France, and onto Germany. And at one point in time, uh, the uh, General Patton said he would have the troops home, we'd get the war over with by Christmas. That would be Christmas of 44. But then the Battle of the Bulge happened. Before the Battle of the Bulge, they were rolling across Europe at a pretty good rate. And uh, they had sent, Patton's Third Army had sent patrols out, recon units, to see what was going on if you went on to Germany to the Siegfried Line, which was a bunch of uh, man-made obstacles to prevent people from getting into Germany. They were pillboxes, heavily armed with guns, and fortified, very thick concrete, uh, a lot of effort to keep tanks from crossing from France into Germany. Uh, the France had a, a fortification similar to that, which Hitler simply bypassed when he invaded France and took France in the early part of the war. So they sent recon units out and went to the Siegfried Line, and it was unmanned. There were no soldiers there. And so Patton wanted to go on and uh, do that. But there was an Operation Tea Garden, which was conducted up in uh, Norway. They were going to try and get some troops in that way. And uh, Montgomery, the British commander, uh, got preferential treatment with respect to fuel. And so they, uh, Patton did not 
get adequate fuel for his tanks. He, Patton was armor. Uh, the Patton's third army was an armor army, and they depended on fuel. He uh, complained to Eisenhower, but they said, well, this is a really important thing, the Tea Garden thing. It ended up being a big failure. It based a lot of its uh, effect on paratroops, and it simply didn't work out. They spent a lot of time, a lot of fuel, and eventually it just fell apart. It wasn't successful. In the meantime, the Siegfried Line was manned, and the United States Army operated with vehicles that were fueled by gasoline. The Germans, all their equipment was diesel. So we could not, many times if you're fighting a war, you can use the enemy's fuel supplies for your own vehicles if you capture them. But we couldn't use diesel fuel. We didn't have diesel engines. And so without gasoline, they were immobile. And then the Battle of the Bulge came. That was in the fall of 1944, and it was the last ditch effort by Hitler to stop the Americans and uh, the Allies in general, Britain. Uh, and Patton moved his army. If anyone's seen the movie Patton, it's very accurate. They moved 100 miles in just a matter of days. Uh, no army had ever done that. You, you obviously are quite a student of the history of that. I wonder how much of it you saw through your seven, eight, nine, ten year old eyes. Well, of course, there was correspondence and mail back and forth, and everyone baked cookies. Uh, I, I kind of deviated from the, uh, what's going on in my civilian life. Uh, the war was in 1941. I was seven. Uh, my wife had a, an uncle and aunt who were at Pearl Harbor when it began. He had graduated from the University of Illinois and got a uh, commission in the ROTC. In 1936, and at the time the war began there, uh, he and his wife, who uh, was from here also, uh, he, her uncle Paul was uh, uh, related through marriage. My wife's aunt uh, was a nurse. She was trained at Burnham City Hospital. My wife had uh, seven aunts who were nurses, which is, seems like a large number. And she was over there, and when they were headed toward Pearl Harbor to bomb the place, uh, she was in her backyard. It was early on a Sunday morning, and Paul, her uncle, was at Ford Island, uh, you know, that morning. I mean, he was working. And they flew so low past their home that she was able to see and wave at the Japanese pilots and they waved back, not knowing what was going to happen. Were there a lot of a lot of people that you heard talking, who talked to people from who had had these experiences, or how how did you find out about it all? Well, at that time I didn't know my wife. Uh, I didn't meet her till much later. But our two next door neighbors were both in the service. Uh, Harold and Gerald James. Uh, Harold James was in the Army Air Corps and he flew P-47 Thunderbolts in Europe. Gerald uh, was in the, in the Army and fought his way through Europe on foot. Uh, they were our next door neighbors. Uh, some very close friends of mothers had a son who was in the Navy. Uh, my brother's best friend he had rheumatic fever when he's, he was young, and when the war started, he and his best friend and some other friends who had gone to school since junior high together, uh, they were one semester from graduating at the University of Illinois. Uh, they were going to graduate in May or June of 1942. And uh, they all went down to enlist right after the war began. Uh, but it wasn't possible. John had a, an enlarged heart, my brother, due to rheumatic fever when he was young. And he cried for about two months. 
because he couldn't enlist. Uh, I think everybody at that point must have been saying things that you, as a, as a young child, heard and were taking in. What did, you, what did your family do as far as um, getting you involved? You know, you, you talked earlier about well, planes and things. No event in my lifetime has had an effect on the world like World War II. It didn't just affect everyone in the United States. It affected everyone in the world. Uh, world War II and the program they had recently by Ken Burns, The War, affected everyone's life. I don't care where you lived, whether you were in the hills of Virginia or wherever you lived, your life was affected. Family members going to war, uh, defense industry, women were moving into the workforce. I met a lady out a few years ago at Willard Airport. They had a B-29 out there called Fifi. And uh, I was talking to some woman out there. She was an older lady looking at the plane. And she had been one of the Rosie the Riveters in Wichita, Kansas. She had helped build B-29s. I'd never actually met uh, a Rosie the Riveter. Uh, my brother's best friend, who was able to enlist, went into the Army Air Corps and he, uh, uh, he wanted to be a pilot. Everyone wanted to be a pilot. But he washed out of pilot school and became a bombardier uh, navigator, uh, principally a navigator on a B-17. And uh, I just learned really just uh, four or five years ago, maybe a little longer, that some of the most skillful uh, people in the Arm, uh, Air Corps were became bombardiers or navigators, not pilots. They had everybody wanted to be a pilot, but with his engineering background, one semester from graduating in mechanical engineering, uh, he became a, he was more valuable as a navigator or bombardier. And so that's what he did. And in early in the European Air War, in 1943, he was shot down over Germany. And uh, it must have been a lot like a little child, young child, living with heroes. Well, uh, everyone did their part that they could. Uh, they're down by the Urbana City uh, City Building Police Station at the corner of Elm and Broadway in Urbana. They had a fenced-in area with snow fence where everyone took their uh, scrap metal, aluminum pans, steel pans, anything that might contribute to the war effort. And uh, everyone took things down there. I know our family did. I, I know everyone did and they would periodically clean it out and add it to the scrap to create bombs, planes, rifles, whatever. Uh, my brother graduated in 1942, uh, and he wasn't able to get in the service, so uh, he got his degree in mechanical engineering, and he first went to Pennsylvania uh, to go to work for a company whose name I don't recall and they made guns. He really wasn't that thrilled about it. He wanted to build airplanes or design airplanes, but he went to work for this company. Elliott Corporation was the name of it, and they built large guns. I don't know how large, but very high caliber for battleships or artillery. He, uh, he really didn't enjoy it that much, and he worked there for a period of time. And then he left there, and he went to uh, California and went to work at Lockheed, where he had worked previously. And uh, so he then worked at Lockheed. He worked at Douglas. And about the time the war ended, he went to work for Hughes Aviation. That's when they were building the flying boat and uh, wow. an XF-11. I didn't really see much of him during the war. He would sometimes drive from Pennsylvania, 
he would leave there on Friday afternoon, drive home just to spend a day or so and then drive back because he was playing a very vital part in the, in the war effort. Uh, one of the major effects on everyone was uh, uh, there was rationing. Uh, rationing was a major thing. Uh, everybody was encouraged to have a victory garden. My mother, all the years that I ever knew her, had a garden of some kind, even if it was two tomato plants. Uh, they had one time had a 26-acre truck farm where they grew vegetables and fruits and things and sold them in the local markets. But they had a, a victory garden uh, on Dublin Street in Urbana. That's uh, over north of Washington Street. And they rented a lot from a woman named Jenny something or other. I can't recall her last name. It was a pretty good sized garden. I would go over there and help them in the garden, do whatever they said. And at that time, aside from canning, which my mother always did a lot of canning, and uh, most everyone did that, you tried to grow your vegetables and fruits and things. And uh, the Amish down in Arthur actually canned things in tin cans, which of course gave them a longer shelf life than canning in uh, jars. And so we used to go down there uh, to Arthur and uh, take things down there and leave them and you go back a week or so later and they would all be in tin cans. And uh, that's one of the things I remember during that period. You had ration books. Uh, ration books affected a lot of things. Not everything was ration. Uh, sugar, I, I don't know exactly. I don't have a full memory of that. Do you like spam? I like spam. I like spam. And on an earlier interview, you interviewed three survivors from the USS Indianapolis. And uh, they all live in this area, which is amazing. I've only known them just uh, four or five years, maybe. But they wrote, uh, there's a book out, and they have an interview, or tried to have an interview, with each of the 317 survivors, which is now down to less than 90. And uh, the one guy they pulled out of the water after they spent five days without food or water in the Pacific, covered in fuel oil. I don't know how they ever survived. Uh, the one guy, when they pulled him out and they asked him what he'd like to eat, he said a Spam sandwich. The Navy particularly seemed to like Spam. Uh, you got used to that during the war. Gasoline was rationed. Gasoline was rationed. So, tires. There right. were no tires. Right. So how did your family get around? Well, the national speed limit during the war was 35 miles per hour. That's throughout the country. That was the maximum speed limit, and that was to reduce fuel consumption and make the tires last longer and things of that sort. And, uh, uh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. At any rate, uh, that was, you had a, various stickers uh, for your windshield, A, B, C. I, I don't recall exactly what each one designated, but you could get so many gallons per week. My father was service manager at the Hudson Garage, which uh, was in Urbana originally, but then moved over to Champaign. And he had uh, access to, you know, uh, he was a mechanic. He could keep our cars going. Uh, he had an opportunity to uh, get used tires sometimes. Uh, everybody did whatever they could. You didn't throw tires away if they had any trat or any life left in them at all. You didn't go on vacations. We didn't go on any vacations uh, from the beginning of the war until after the war was over. And I don't mean over like 1945, I mean over like 1947 or later because 
you still didn't have the availability of, of new cars, new tires and things. It, took, it takes time. Uh, if, like when they federalized the 106 to go to Panama or Fort Polk, you know, it takes time to train these units and get them into a situation where they can be useful. And this is one of the things people don't appreciate, uh, how long it takes to put an army together to go fight a war, that you have to have the equipment. The United States won the war because of our manufacturing ability. No other country in the world was able to produce the things that we could. We saved Russia with our Lend-Lease program. Uh, we saved England by getting involved and helping them with products and also physically fighting the war. Uh, the Russians, of course, were on the Eastern Front and they weren't involved initially when we got involved in the war, but then Hitler, uh, you know, was going to take Russia and uh, he was a big anti-communist person. Uh, but at any rate, tires, cars, there were no new cars manufactured after early 1942. So what did you kids do to amuse yourselves? Well, uh, we, we played. <laughs> that was one of the good things. Uh, I used to go to the library. They always had a lot of information on uh, newspapers and things of that sort. My, my brother taught me my, uh, my math and my reading before I ever went to school. I didn't go to kindergarten. Uh, I, he taught me at home. I went, started first grade, and so I was in first grade, I think, when the war began. And uh, then my sister got married and uh, of course, she was wanting to have Bob come home again. Uh, she became pregnant uh, from after they got married and before he actually went overseas. And so uh, she had a child and she lived in an apartment in Urbana. And uh, uh, my brother, as I say, he graduated in 42 and then went off to uh, contribute to his ability to provide design effort and engineering and stayed in California. He never came back to live in Illinois again. What, what effect did the war have on, the, on your family and other families that you can kind of look at and point out? Well, of course, uh, war is a terrible thing. It's, it's a total waste in terms of uh, accomplishing things. But at the same time, if you look at history, you'll see that people have always had wars. And World War II was certainly among the worst. I don't know if the people today, on Iwo Jima, for example, my wife had an uncle who landed on Iwo Jima four days after his 19th birthday. He was in the Marine Corps and he was carried off. But to have 7,500 people killed in a 35-day battle on Iwo Jima. Could the people today stand that? Could they withstand the thought of uh, people in Europe being bombed? Uh, and it, we, our country was lucky in that we didn't feel the direct effects of the war. We produced the equipment that won the war for, for almost every country. Uh, were on the winning side, but we did not have the bombing raids. Uh, in, in California, north of uh, Santa Barbara, a short distance, is a restaurant where the Japanese shelled that once with a submarine. They surfaced and shelled that restaurant. Uh, there were they, they sent up balloons with explosives on them that uh, were sent over the Pacific, you know, with the balloons, and some of them exploded in, uh, you know, Washington and places like that, but they didn't really do any damage. We interned all the Japanese that they could get their hands on. Uh, 
you know, saying that they were a threat to the country. I, I don't believe that. I think that was wrong. Uh, but anyway, they were incarcerated in California in essentially uh, low-class prisons until eventually uh, when we needed more people in the army and many of the Japanese wanted to volunteer in uh, a supplemental program to the war. There was a program about a Japanese guy who got into the Army Air Corps. I think the name of it was Most Honorable Son. I think that was the title of this program. I thought it was just terrific. And he was able to uh, participate before many of the others. And they used him as an example to uh, get others to participate. There was one division that was entirely Japanese uh, fighting, uh, you know, primarily in Europe. So you went to movies when you were a kid? I went to movies, thank God for movies. Uh, at the Princess Theater in Urbana, they had serials. Mostly it was westerns. Uh, I, I never missed a weekend on Saturday going to the Princess Theater. How much did it cost for a movie? I think a dime. Uh, they had, most of the serials they had were uh, as they say, cowboys. Uh, they had some other things, uh, probably uh, like The Shadow or, you know, Captain Midnight. I listened to radio programs and every the afternoon. Guy, the good guy won. The good guy always won. Uh, they had one, my favorite radio program was Tom Mix and the Ralston Straight Shooters. But there was Jack Armstrong, Captain Midnight, uh, one of the programs that came on later was uh, Sky King. My uh, wife's uncle, who had been at Pearl Harbor, uh, his, his wife, immediately when she realized what had happened, uh, went to the Pearl Harbor to volunteer medical abilities. And two weeks went by before either her husband or she knew that the other was still alive or was okay. And so she spent two weeks after December 7th uh, acting as a nurse, which is, of course, how she was trained. Their daughter, who was, uh, let's see, she would have been about three years old at the time of Pearl Harbor. They had a uh, Hawaiian girl who was... Uh, a housekeeper for them. When she left to go to the base to help with her medical practice, she left her daughter with the housekeeper and wasn't able to get home for a couple of weeks. When she came home after Pearl Harbor, when they came home on leave, and Sky King was on the radio, when uh, at the beginning of the program they had some words back and forth and Sky King's in his airplane and he dives the airplane and of course you have the sound of an airplane accelerating and the wind and the diving and the whining of a plane in a dive and she would dive under the dining room table and start crying uh, from having been there to Pearl Harbor and hearing sounds like that. So it, it was very traumatizing for people who were actually involved with the war. When I was in the Army Air Corps, <laughs> when I was in the Army, I never made it to the Air Corps, but when I was in the Army in the mid-50s in Korea, one of the people that I hung out with some was a kid from New York. His name was Albert Linke, a German name. His his father had been in the 8th Air Corps bombing Germany. His mother, shortly before the war uh, began in 1940, went back home with Albert, who was just a child, and she was from Germany. He, he was uh, a, a, an American-born German, but she was from Germany, and they went back to see her parents and his grandparents and the war began and they couldn't leave. So during the war, 
he spent the entire war years in Germany uh, while his father was trying to bomb Germany, was bombing Germany. And uh, he told me stories about after the war, the difficulties he had in Germany, uh, stealing wood, stealing food, uh, just to survive. Uh, it, it was extremely difficult. Uh, but our, our own situation with the rationing, the tires, no cars, you really couldn't go anywhere. The best you might be able to do, because you couldn't go very far, was on a weekend, Sunday. Uh, my father worked uh, six days a week because you had to keep all the cars that were running, running. And so he put a lot of hours in. and. On Sunday, he would go down, we'd go down and get a Chicago Tribune and uh, go down. There used to be a fruit market there on University Avenue, where Huey's was later. And we'd go by there and uh, buy sometimes a watermelon. Uh, one of the, the big treats was to go down to a place on Broadway called Wilson's. And it was a, a, they sold ice cream. They didn't sell it in the round containers they have today. They had what they called a brick of ice cream. One of their principal flavors was uh, called White House. And it had a lot of, uh, you might call it tutti frutti today. It had a lot of cut up candy in it, little pieces of red and green, and had nuts, excuse me, walnuts. And they would. Uh, uh, it was. It was. They'd cut it out of a long piece, uh, and it was called a brick. So we would get a brick of ice cream. It was about the size of a brick, and that that was a big treat. Uh, you just didn't do much. You listened to the radio. Uh, you visited. You asked your neighbors uh, if they'd heard from Harold or Gerald or. Uh, Patsy McCormick and her husband, who lived over on Springfield Avenue, whose son was in the Navy. Uh, Daryl Reno, I told you, was shot down over Germany. They strafed him on the way down and shot his right arm off. And so he was in a German prison camp till the war ended. Was any of that kind of information hidden from kids, or were, did they just tell you what was going on? You know, How it's did pretty. You find out? Excuse me, it's pretty hard to hide an arm missing. But, with, but, but when the story came back, before he came back? Well, we knew he was in a prison camp, and we knew he'd lost his arm. His mother lived alone on Cottage Grove in Urbana. He used to come over to her house all the time, and he and John built model airplanes together. They went to school together. Uh, he, was, he was his best friend. Sounds like people were all family in a way. Everybody, everybody had a flag in their window just about. With uh, uh, you know, you had blue stars if you had people serving in the service. If someone was killed, you had a gold star. My brother-in-law, who had been in Patton's Third Army, uh, his mother had four boys in the service. Uh, three in Europe, Bob, Al, and Owen, and the youngest boy was in the Marine Corps and was in the Pacific. And they all came back with no major injuries. After the war was over, I asked my brother-in-law, Bob, one time, what the closest was that he came to getting seriously hurt. And uh, he was a tank commander. and. Uh, at that time, the driver of the tank sat below the tank commander who was up in the turret. And he, uh, an 88 millimeter shell from a German tank. Uh, the Germans had an 88 millimeter gun, which was built primarily for aviation defense. It was a very powerful gun, probably the best gun in World War II for that type of thing. I mean, it could fire shells that would explode at 5,000, uh, or at, at 
20 or 25,000 feet, that's four or five miles in the air to shoot down B-24s and B-17s or whatever. And they also put them in tanks and an 88 millimeter round uh, came through the tank. The, the co tank commander sat in the turret and his feet were on the driver's shoulders. That's how he controlled the tank. If he wanted to turn right or left or stop or whatever, he could uh, push on the shoulders or tap his helmet with his foot. Uh, he's right there. And an 88 millimeter shell came through the tank and blew his driver's hat off. But it didn't hurt Bob. It's, it's a tough. That's close. Yeah. But the, the war just went on and on. They had war bond drives. <clears throat> And uh, wanted to. Everybody was buying war bonds. You had payroll deductions. They would take it out of your uh, paycheck before you brought it home. They had bonds of various amounts. People would frequently buy bonds and put them in their children's name. Uh, this is how they raised money for the war. Many actors and people participated in war bond drives. And uh, they, two of the biggest war bond drives they had in this area that I recall, uh, they used to conduct these over in Champaign at the intersection of Neal, Church, Main. Uh, there was a Flatiron building both in Urbana and in Champaign. The Urbana Flatiron building was where the V is between Springfield Avenue and Main Street. And that burned down in 1948. The Champagne Building was located there facing south at the intersection of uh, Neal and Church and Main Street, and I don't recall the street, it may have been Hickory, uh, which angled off and there was a flat iron building there. And that's where they conducted the war bond drives. I re recall the two biggest I saw they had a two-man Japanese submarine, which had been captured at Pearl Harbor. There was uh, the Japanese attempted to, I think there may have been six two-man submarines that they hauled on other submarines. And just before they were going to uh, make the attack, the air attack, they tried to sneak into Pearl Harbor. They had a submarine net to prevent submarines getting into Pearl Harbor. But they tried to sneak into the harbor, and one of them ran aground. And this one that ran aground was captured. They found one of those two-man submarines uh, not more than five or six years ago. One of them was still missing, and they finally found it. But they brought that two-man submarine, they put it on the back of a truck, a, you know, flatbed truck. And they came, and they had people that came. I couldn't tell you who the people were and uh, used that to entice you to buy more bonds. They had different bond drives. I don't know what the total was, maybe half a dozen or more to keep financing the war as time went on. Did kids get involved in that? Well, uh, you, you, you were aware of it. Uh, you went to the bond drives. You understood what was going on, that they were raising money for the war, and uh, seeing the two-man submarine was exciting. They later came back with a Messerschmitt, a German fighter, single-seat fighter, that had been shot down, and it was basically just the fuselage, uh, and it was on the back of a truck. This was another war bond drive. Uh, I still have a piece of control cable from that plane that uh, one of my friends had some uh, diagonals to cut cable, and we cut a couple pieces of cable off of it. People did this a lot. They, I don't know what the thing looked like by the time the war bond drive was over. But people would take a piece of fabric or, you know, as a souvenir. Uh, I got a little piece of a 
a cable at home somewhere. Uh, you talked about things you traded around too. Was would that oh, yes. be like? Would you trade that? No. That was very unique. Uh, children traded patches. Uh, you, every soldier has a patch on his shoulder that tells what organization he's attached to, whether it's the 8th Air Force uh, or what, whatever it may be, 15th Air Force. Uh, the Flying Tigers who were in the Pacific, uh, General Claire Chenault was the commander of the Flying Tigers. It was a totally volunteer group that went to China to fight the Japanese. This is before Pearl Harbor. Uh, he went over there. They were well known. And you know, if you were an aviation enthusiast and you were interested in what was going on in the war, you would look at magazines. My brother always had model airplane news and aviation magazines. And we talked about those things. And uh, I was aware of the Flying Tigers. Uh, one of the serial companies, I'm trying to think which, I, I don't recall, up in Battle Creek, Michigan, whoever that is, maybe Kellogg, they had, uh, I, I think you sent away for them, but you sent in uh, a couple box tops. That was a big thing to do back in those days for kids. Uh, you, you send in a couple box tops and you got this paper airplane. It was just one sheet of heavy paper and you could cut it out and uh, assemble it the way they told you to and you put a penny in the nose for a, count, a weight to balance the airplane and you could actually glide it around. Uh, you know, that was very exciting. And they had a whole series of these. As a matter of fact, when our son was uh, probably in the same age range I had been. They actually came out with those again. This would be in the 60s. And I sent away and got a whole set of them for my son. Uh, that was a way to reminisce with him. But my brother had taught me how to build model airplanes, gliders. Uh, he built free flight airplanes. Uh, before the war. Could you yeah. identify planes? Did you learn to do that? Oh yeah. I have uh, a number of books that uh, I, I got as a child. Uh, I have a, one of my prized books is a, a restricted uh, actual Air Force uh, recognition manual so you could recognize an airplane uh, from any country. And they had little silhouette models. I, I may have had one or two of them, but they were really hard to get, that they used for aircraft identification. They were a 3D molded, I think they were hard rubber. They were black, had no markings on them or anything. You had to identify the silhouette so you'd know what kind of a plane it was. And there were not a lot of them around, but there were some. I may have had one or two. Uh, were what you supposed I... to identify then a plane if you saw it? Was that, that the was idea? That was the idea. They had civil defense drills, uh, you know, what to do in case of an enemy attack. Of course, there were spies in the country. Uh, and I know one of the things my mother did to contribute to the war effort was she went down to Thornburn Junior High School. I don't know exactly how often. I would say two or three times a week. And they did this throughout the country. And they rolled bandages for the Red Cross. Uh, they would take the, the bandages, I don't know, they were a certain length, and, and they would roll these bandages to be sent over to Europe or the Pacific to contribute to help them, the medics who were attending the wounded. Uh, she did that. Religiously, she got some sort of little uh, award for participating in this. Everybody did this sort of thing. Uh, as I say, my father was a service manager at the Hudson Garage and later the general manager. And his, his goal was to keep people's cars going. 
you know, with used tires or whatever. Uh, it was, meat was rationed, sugar was rationed, and uh, we were lucky in many respects living in the Midwest where we were in, in an area where they had farming, where they raised cattle, where they raised hogs. And uh, he would uh, occasionally have the opportunity to get some meat from a farmer uh, who was slaughtering a cow or a pig or whatever. Uh, we bought our eggs uh, from farmers. Uh, there was always grain available. Uh, there was corn to eat, and uh, as I say, everybody had a garden. And so, uh, if you if you worked at it, you could maintain a pretty normal life, uh, you know, by by raising a garden and doing things like that. And uh, so they had the scrap drives, they had the bond drives, they had the little ration books. Uh, when you went to the grocery store, you they had a little sort of like a blue chip or green stamp book, if you recall those. I think those may have come out of World War II. Maybe they were before, I don't know. But they would look at your book and see how many pounds of sugar you might be able to buy. Uh, you had to be thrifty. One of the things I remember, uh, and I can't recall the name of uh, the guy that did this, but he invented, uh, he had margarine. First time I ever saw margarine and his name was Jellic or something. I, I don't recall his name, the guy that came up with this. But you bought margarine. You couldn't get butter most of the time. So margarine was a substitute for butter. That's the first time I ever saw margarine. And it was a white, uh, pliable, uh, I, I don't really know what it was made of. But he couldn't, somehow the people who, the dairy people would not let him color the margarine. It couldn't be yellow like butter. It was white. But he was able, after a period of time, to put in a what looked like a little red dime-sized capsule that was in the package. And you would, uh, you'd have this plastic bag with this margarine in it and this little red capsule, and you could squeeze the plastic bag break that capsule and then you mixed it thoroughly by kneading the plastic bag and you would have yellow margarine like butter. That was a big deal. I got to do that a lot. And, well, I don't know if I did it a lot. I don't. I think even margarine was limited. But at any rate, it was a pretty good substitute for butter. That was uh, something that was interesting. Uh, ballpoint pens uh, came about during World War II, or so I have read. I, I didn't see them before then, and they were developed so navigators and bombardiers uh, on airplanes, being the planes are bounced around by the flak that the Germans are shooting at them, and uh, just the vibration of the plane itself. You couldn't really use a pencil, a lead pencil because of the vibration you're trying to write and it's breaking. And pens at that time were, uh, you usually used an inkwell with a pen in those days when the war began. But as time went on, they got refill cartridges that were used in the uh, pens. And uh, so they invented the ballpoint pen primarily for the use of navigators and bombardiers during the war. I don't know exactly when they became available, but it might have been near the end of the war. I don't know. Chanute Field was a beehive of activity. One of my cousins uh, was in the Army Air Corps, and I recall that he, he flew into Chanute. This was early in the war, and we were able to go up and see him take off in a B-18 bomber, which was, I think, called a Bolo. Uh, all bombers and fighters had nicknames. And uh, he was, uh, was going somewhere, and 
both my wife and I, I my wife had a one, two, three, I, I would say three or four uncles in the service. Uh, most of my uncles were just the way ages work out. Most of my uncles had been in World War I. I think I had uh, four or five uncles in World War I. But your age determined the part you played in anything during that period of time. So we would play, uh, we had near where I lived, they had a large parking lot, uh, which was gravel and it had three, what we called islands, uh, three areas where there were some trees and brush and stuff like that. We called those our three jungles and we would uh, go over there and play war and uh, shortly before, uh, I, I remember when, uh, Roosevelt passed away, which was, I think, in the early part of 45. Uh, I was over there playing in the jungles with some of my friends, and uh, we had built a big cardboard fort, and uh, we were throwing rocks at it. I mean, we started out with a one or two inch rock but I remember uh, we were going to try bigger rocks and so I was behind the, inside the fort and a rock about six inches in size came sailing through there and hit me in the head. Uh, and that was I think the same day that Roosevelt passed away because I remember some people came down the, Sham, the Urbana Champagne Urbana Courier which was located on Rice Street in Urbana where the Courier Cafe is now. That's where the Courier was published until it went out of business. And they came down the street selling extras, uh, saying that Roosevelt had died. Uh, of course, we played over there all the time. I, I just remember that particular incident happened the day that he died. Uh, what would you say if you had to kind of put it together, what affected living through the war at your age? How, how did, what did that affect you? Well, uh, you were really upset by a lot of things that happened. People got killed, uh, people got seriously wounded, just as they do today. And when you consider the hundreds of thousands of people that this happened to, like Nancy's uncle being carried off Iwo Jima, uh, like Daryl Reno having his arm shot off. And when he came back after the war, uh, he got married to the girl that he intended to marry before the war. And they lived over on the in the parade ground at the university. People might not know the area to the west of the uh, stadium was actually called the parade ground. The armory was built about the middle teens, about the time of World War I. And over opposite the stadium was the parade ground. And that's how WPGU began. It began as a radio station for the parade grounds. And they had these very small if I would say would be equivalent to maybe a 10 or 12 foot by 40 foot, very skimpily built uh, particle board, they didn't have particle board, uh, masonite and wood structure. And only students who were married could live there. And uh, Darrell and his wife, after they were married, lived there. And since uh, engineers depended on their ability to use a slide rule and to do drafting, that was a big part of engineering in those years. Since he had lost his arm and he only had a hook over there, he wasn't able to do that anymore. So his all but last semester to get a degree in engineering was gone. And he became a lawyer 
and eventually became a federal judge up in Pontiac, Illinois, and had a very successful career, but he couldn't be an engineer. And you see things like this, and uh, of course after the war ended, I knew many veterans and heard many stories. They didn't talk so much about the war, but they did talk about airplanes, about uh, when my brother-in-law came home from Panama back early in the war after he'd been federalized, he was talking about jeeps. I didn't know what a jeep was. Nobody knew what a jeep was until the late 30s. So many things we take for granted. There are jeeps everywhere in the world today that Americans took there for the war. And they've gone on. Uh, the British Rover Company, uh, Japanese Toyota, have all copied Jeeps to make similar type vehicles. So all of this technology was spread throughout the world. There is no one on the face of the earth today that in some way or another wasn't affected by World War II. The American soldiers that came back, many of them had never been more than 20 miles from where they were born. And suddenly they're everywhere, everywhere in the world. They might be in the Pacific, in Europe, uh, all over the place and seeing things they had never seen before, meeting people they had never seen before. And so subsequently they were affected in a way that many of them never went back to live where they were born, never went back to that area where they lived 20 miles. Uh, from whatever they did. So if you had to sum it up, what would you say? The, the world changed? Absolutely. The, the world changed dramatically. Can you, can you get that? I just got that. But it's okay, well then why don't, why don't we, could we stop there? Yeah. Would that be all right to stop there? Whatever you want to do. That 